My name is Kristen cox Mailing. I'm a consultant working on some of the advocacy elements of the task force's work. And uh, I'm going to take a forward-looking view of the GTFCC advocacy um, to complement what, what Fru has just presented. So, OK. So first, I'll give some brief context on where we are in the advocacy strategy development process. So overall, the purpose of advocacy is twofold, to, to change policies and to mobilize resources. Uh, but we have to start by defining the alternative vision of the world that we hope to achieve. So we know that our ultimate end is to end cholera. Uh, and before that, by 2030, to reduce cholera deaths by 90% and eliminate in 20 countries. So what policy changes do we need to achieve this vision? There we go. We know we need a well-coordinated, multi-sectoral response, uh, including OCV in most settings, long-term sustainable wash in all settings, um, and strengthening of health systems, including for surveillance and primary health care. So, and all this along with strong community engagement. Okay, so our next step is to understand in detail what resources we need to implement these policies and program elements. So over the last 12 to 18 months, um, we've had a strong effort to this end. Uh, so you're all aware of the work of Guy Hutton at UNICEF, I think, I hope, in modeling WASH resources, um, as well as cost-benefit analysis, um, including his tool for country costing, which is, I think, interesting currently in beta. Um, and then there's the work of uh, Melissa Coe and Stefano Malvolti um, from MMGH, and I think all of you have been to various working groups where that work has been shared. Um, we also heard just a few minutes ago, maybe an hour ago, from David Olson at the Secretariat about some uh, costing work he's working on with respect to surveillance. And we know that there's a range of other uh, costing exercises and, and investment exercises uh, currently in progress. Um, we heard uh, from IVI yesterday about an exercise they're doing, and um, Cambridge and others, and lots of partners are, are contributing to this um, the, this body of knowledge. So, so we can say we now have uh, sufficient data on resource needs. Um, now, these models will certainly continue to be vetted, and we'll, our understanding will only you know, become, will only improve with, with peer, peer review and continued vetting. But for now, <laughs> we have what we need. Um, we, can, we can move forward to capture some of these message, messages in advocacy. So here we go. What are our current asks of decision makers? based on this data. And this is all captured in the theory of change. So this isn't new. This is just a uh, 30,000 foot view, I would say. So um, we know that the first two elements here are covered in depth in the roadmap. Um, so to bring the, the left two elements together, uh, we need to manage to make strategic asks of the right decision makers at the right time. Um, and that will help us to mobilize the resources that are necessary to support the policy changes to, in turn, allow us to live in a world that no longer has cholera. So um, from the various investment modeling exercises that our colleagues have conducted, we now have these data points that we can take forward in advocacy. And I'd like to give you a sense of some of the messages that we've been using, um, both to help you in your own efforts and as well as to, you know, to get your feedback, essentially. So these messages were also informed heavily by a side meeting on advocacy following the WASH working group meeting in February. So at that time, we identified some priority messages and uh, by audience. And so that, that is also reflected in, in what I'll um, explain today. Okay. So, um, and this, this new data is all embedded in our existing narrative. So, uh, it's all going to feel very familiar and consistent. Um, and our challenge is to convey uh, overall why should donors and countries invest in cholera. So we often say that cholera is a single disease, but it really tells quite a lot about the people who suffer from it. Uh, so we've always compared the map of cholera to a map of poverty. And we know that cholera doesn't happen by chance. It impacts communities already burdened by conflict, by lack of infrastructure, by poor health systems, by malnutrition. So 
it's not just a disease in this way, but a, a symptom of a broader set of social, economic, and political circumstances um, that lead to overall poor health, high mortality, and human suffering. So ending cholera is not just about preventing unnecessary deaths, but it's fundamentally about changing living conditions for the world's poorest people. So on these slides, for fun, I've, <laughs> I've paired some of the key messages with some of the social media share graphics that we've used to help to try and convey those messages. Um, and I've, I've left citations out just to keep these, these slides clear, but in the online version, I'll be sure to include them in case you want to consult the original research. So here's what we know today about investing in color control in alignment with the global roadmap. We have three main messages. So first, I think, and probably most important, uh, is that the global roadmap goals are feasible. And in cholera is possible, and we have the tools to do it. Uh, the modeling that our MMGH colleagues have done um, of country adoption of the roadmap has shown that these goals are feasible, uh, ambitious, but wholly achievable. And this is also borne out in our real life experiences. Um, we're seeing the results, essentially. So although cholera still, this is our message, kills 95,000 people per year and sickens 2.9 million more, as we all know, it tends to occur in predictable geographic locations. So this is important because it makes it possible to target interventions. So for example, 90% of cholera cases in Africa are concentrated in hotspots inhabited by less than 5% of the total population. So by investing in those 5%, these are people living under the harshest conditions, we can reduce deaths from cholera as well as improve equity. So that supports SDG 10, which a message we'll come back to in a moment, uh, reducing inequality. And moreover, because these hotspots play an important role in the spread of cholera to other regions, uh, we know that controlling cholera in hotspots is a critical part of the strategy to end cholera worldwide. Okay. So modeling shows that by 2030, at least 20 countries will have eliminated cholera as a public health issue of concern and additional 22 countries will be on their way to elimination. The benefits generated by successful implementation of the global roadmap are huge. So 34 million cholera cases and 1.1 million cholera deaths can be prevented over this period. Okay, so the next message is about the broader benefits of cholera control. So we know that going after cholera holds the power to bring immense benefits for a wide range of WASH-related diseases and broader development challenges. So cholera cases and deaths, that's just the beginning. We know that global roadmap, the global roadmap will support SDGs three and six. Um, three, by, not only by reducing cholera cases, but by reducing the burden of other diseases transmitted through contaminated water. Um, poor, fecal, poor fecal waste management and, and poor hygiene as well. Um, so various causes of diarrhea, dysentery, shigella, trachoma, uh, typhoid. So implementing the global roadmap would prevent 1.7, oh, sorry, thank you for, I forgot to advance the slide. Um, yeah, so implementing the global roadmap would prevent 1.7 billion cases of diarrhea and 0.9 million diarrhea deaths. I know this will mostly be among vulnerable children. Um, and this is important, we can tie to the message used in the diarrhea community uh, about repeated episodes of diarrhea causing long-term deficits in a child's physical and cognitive growth, reinforcing the cycle of poverty. <coughs> okay, so you see we have SDGs three and six, and of, cor of course, and then also uh, SDG two, zero hunger, um, by improving nutritional status by reducing cases of diarrhea and then reducing inequalities, as we've talked about. Okay. So our next message is that cholera is a very effective use of resources. So cholera control, uh, we can call as much an economic investment as an investment in health and human lives. So we know currently cholera costs an average of $57 per person, which comes to $26 billion per year globally. And this includes costs related to emergency response, healthcare, and loss of life. 
uh, but these don't uh, these estimates don't include indirect economic and social consequences uh, related to cholera. So we know that large scale cholera outbreaks can reduce national GDP by up to 2.5 percent. So the estimated investment required for achieving the global roadmap goals is, on average, $11 per person per year, per year per person living living in hotspots, um, and in turn, countries could derive $620 billion in economic benefits by 2030 through roadmap implementation. So another point we want to convey with some audiences is that, uh, as countries strive toward middle income status, it's going to become increasingly important. Um, that they address cholera because it's you know, fundamentally a disease of poverty. Um, okay, so going back to our core narrative, we say that cholera shows us the precise locations of people and communities who have been left behind in the course of global development. Uh, so by urgently targeting cholera hotspots, we're putting those, the world's poorest people back on the development agenda. Um, and we, we often say that color is highly sensitive and highly specific indicator for extreme poverty, and that makes targeting cholera an effective way to prioritize our investments to achieve maximum impact. Great. Okay. So, in fact, and, and this is a, a data point very relevant to the WASH community, um, the cost-benefit ratio for investing in, in cholera hotspots um, more than doubles. So, from a return of 4.3 uh, dollars per dollar spent, and that's meeting MDG targets. That's uh, uh, an estimate from Guy Hutton um, for combined water supply and sanitation interventions globally, compared to a return of $10 for every dollar invested in washing a cholera hotspot. Um, and, and this return comes from targeting these areas of unique deprivation. Um, the largest contributor to this increase is, is actually human lives saved. Uh, counting for about 75% of the impact. So those are some of the messages and supporting data we're using, and I would welcome your thoughts and feedback um, after the session. Um, so next I'll get a little bit more specific, I think, about uh, how we can take these messages and, and make specific asks of decision makers. So first, and, and these top pieces really work in tandem. Uh, so we're asking donors and partners to fully resource the GTFCC mechanism with um, existing funding, with new funding, with in-kind funding. And um, that really works in uh, closely with um, what we're asking of color-affected countries, which is to create, resource, and implement multi-sectoral uh, color control plans uh, for controller elimination. And um, these work together because I think for cholera, I think the main chief form of advocacy we're going to see at country level will be this um, sort of technical advocacy. So in-country coordinators who have um, some ability to convene uh, politically as well as to provide technical support to countries as they, as they create their plans. And then we have a, a range of secondary asks of, of donors, of multilaterals, of implementing partners. And, and first and foremost, that's you know, provide resources for countries' natural cholera control plans. Um, Second, uh, we, you know, we know we're seeing decreasing funding in WASH, so um, let's reverse that trend, increase funding for sustainable WASH in line with SDG 6. Uh, and, and finally, uh, no, sorry, two more. Ensure that existing investments, particularly in WASH, prioritize co cholera hotspots. So that's a little bit more of a policy ask than a direct resource ask, um, but a really important work stream. Um, and finally, support Gavi replenishment. Without, uh, without Gavi support, um, the implementation of the roadmap becomes infeasible. So it's, uh, it's important. So um, I haven't included it here, but I think uh, we need to ask countries to also, we need to, we need to advocate with countries to begin to include cholera in their global financing facility country plans. Um, that's uh, an important source of funding that can be unlocked for cholera moving forward. Um, Right. So I'll talk a bit now about the mechanism itself, the GTFCC mechanism. Um, so this is over a, th a three-year view, I should specify, a three-year view of what this uh, mechanism might look like and what it might cost, and therefore what we'll be asking of donors. Um, so 
we know that support to countries is a sort of critical element of the roadmap and of advocacy. And so the GTSCC proposes to carry this out through two complementary mechanisms. And let me get to that. I'll come back to this. So we're on the first bucket here, coordination and country support. So here's the, the GTFCC operational model that Dominique shared um, earlier today, I believe. And um, there's, it's, it, there's really two components. You, you see the, the governance structure in gray, but we'll talk for now about the, the yellow and the blue um, pieces. So the uh, WHO cholera program, um, they would continue the mandate of establishing and upholding norms and standards for cholera control efforts. Um, the current budget shows a cost of about 1.2 million per year. Uh, and then the second component is the country support platform. And that would be a separate operational entity hosted by a partner agency um, that would lead support of the GTFCC to countries for the implementation of the roadmap. Um, and that would include technical assistance on the short, medium, and long term. We're looking at a cost uh, for the country support platform at around uh, 6.9 million per year, but depending on the specific execution, somewhere between five and 15 million. And that includes direct support to countries and a, a much, much smaller budget for global staffing. So Dominique has, has reiterated time and time again that we, <laughs> the organism has a small head and long legs. So I, I like his metaphor. <laughs> we'll stick with that. Um, great. So I'd like to just say, and I, apologies for rushing through time. <laughs> so I um, will say a bit about fundraising for the GTFCC um, uh, mechanism. So my group, uh, GHV, is working with the GTFCC secretariat to expand its donor base. And our focus here is private foundations and corporate donors. Um, this is a small task team, uh, really led by Dominique. And uh, I'd also like to um, acknowledge the contribution of John Oldfield from Global Water 2020. Um, he's helped to make, us, make a lot of connections for us. Thank you, John. Uh, and Tina and Amber from the Gates Foundation have been great about exchanging ideas and uh, put, setting us on the right path. So we're targeting foundations and corporations that focus on health, WASH, vaccines, disaster relief, and recovery. Um, why this list? Uh, and, and you're probably wondering about some that are missing. Um, so I think it's important to understand the context that we're working in here. We have five major replenishments or resource mobilization efforts happening in essentially the same time frame um, in an environment where official uh, development assistance, ODA, has declined. So uh, we know the global financing facility raised $2 billion. Um, we know that WHO is hoping to raise $40 billion. Uh, the Global Fund is, is asking for $14 billion for their replenishment in October. Um, GPI, the uh, Polio Eradication Initiative, um, is asking $3 billion by November. So, and then we'll have Gavi will launch their investment case um, in August, I believe, for a five-year period. And replenishment will be sometime uh, mid-year 2020. So all this to say we need to be mindful of other health and development priorities and, and carve out a space for cholera that's, uh, that's not competitive and uh, with, with those initiatives, but that fulfills our, all of our needs. So we're currently prospecting new donors. We've been doing outreach, and uh, we're building collateral materials to use in that outreach. So examples of the donors that we've targeted to date, uh, and we're supporting Dominique to do this outreach, and he's an excellent advocate, as I'm sure you all know. Um, so the Hilton Foundation, the Vital Foundation, Wagner Foundation, Unilever, P&G are some of the, of the targets. Um, Dominique has had some promising conversations with the Margaret, Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Um, some of you may remember they were an early investor in the OCV stockpile uh, and the Helmsley Charitable Trust. So both of those organizations have expressed interest in the country support platform. Um, and Cargill, in particular, was interested in, uh, as well, in OCV in, in non-GAVI eligible countries. Uh, so we'll continue to, to prospect and reach out to, to donors in the coming months um, to raise funds with an emphasis on this country support. Um, so I, I understand that lots of us are raising funds, but we do welcome any recommendations uh, from this group on donors to target or, or connections you can make. 
um, and we appreciate that. So let's see. Uh, I'll just touch briefly on the other component here, which is I think the ask of color affected countries, which is create your color plans, fund them with domestic resources to an appropriate level, and implement, implement the plans. Um, and I think uh, this comes back to, to the country support platform. Um, I think a lot of advocacy for color control is going to be this technical advocacy. And um, I think these country coordinators can really build excitement for the objective of controlling or eliminating cholera. So it should be a, a priority as far as advocacy is concerned. And I understand is a priority as far as technical support is concerned. So, uh, so I, I you know, put it out to the group to think about um, whether your organization might someday in a, be in a position to, to support on that. All right, so I'll come back now to the secondary asks of donors, multilaterals, and implementing partners. Uh, I think we should all try and keep these kinds of objectives in mind with our communications with donors and with partners. Um, and I think over time we'll start to see each of these and probably more as distinct work streams for the, for the GTFCC. Uh, so when and if your organization uh, would like to engage on developing one or more of these work streams, um, I'd invite you to get in touch. Um, I think there are a lot of directions it could go. So, and, and then lastly, since I'm sure I'm over time, I want to let everyone know about uh, some of the communications resources that we do already have available. So uh, we often do mini campaigns around some of the international observance days, as you saw in, um, in Fru's presentation, uh, with op-eds and social media posts. So if you um, have an interest in accessing those, um, I'd be happy, I, we have a Dropbox file essentially that a number of you are a part of and I, I can add anyone who's interested. Um, there's a similar folder for color control champions. So if you have a high profile person in your organization or otherwise, um, that would be interested in support to write op-eds or um, to do more social media work around cholera, we would be very happy to support them in that way. Um, so please be in touch. And 